It's good to see you this morning and good to have you here with us uh, as we join together to worship our Lord. It's a beautiful day outside, a beautiful day inside, and uh, I have a lot to celebrate and a lot to be thankful for. Would you stand together? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to sing some songs and, and continue on in our worship time. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your presence here this morning. We've gathered here not just for another social gathering, but we've gathered here because we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we want to worship our Lord. And we want to do it together, and we want to grow and learn. Lord, thank you for Homewood Baptist Church. Thank you for this facility and this property, and thank you for these people that make up the church. I thank you for our guests today, and pray that Everyone here would know that we're in your presence, not because we're gathered together, but because that's our intent, to worship you and to spend time with you. I pray, Father, you'd also, um, if there's anyone in our midst that doesn't know you, that you would just pour out your presence and that they would be able to hear and to feel and to experience and to know that there is a Savior, a Savior who loves them dearly. And there is a God who is holy and just, and he is the judge. And he has provided a way uh, for us to have uh, righteousness, for us to be uh, in right standing with him through Jesus. Help us to come to understand that even better today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You ready to sing? Yeah. Yes. All right. Remain standing. Give, take a deep breath. You only get one. You ready?
it seems like in this for your blessing down on us and uh, on America and, and Lord we just thank you for that and, and for our and now Father as we come to this part of our service Lord uh, we pray that, that you will bless the here and that you will bless the giver Lord we pray that you will take this gift as these folks as we give our gifts and our offerings to you this morning Pray that you'll take these gifts, that you'll multiply them, and that you'll spread them throughout all the world. And Lord, we just thank you for letting us the honor and the privilege of us being able to participate in your kingdom's growth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
praise team is beginning to practice or rehearse on Wednesday nights, this coming Wednesday. So we're going to start that back. We used to do that all the time, and we stopped that around COVID. So we're going to start uh, implement that again. All the things going on, and um, we have a, a new baby that was born. Uh, Joel and Penny Lawson's uh, granddaughter, Hannah Grace Lawson, on June 7th, 7 pounds, 14 ounces. Congratulations. They've been grinning ever since, just from ear to ear. So it's, that's great. It's a wonderful thing to celebrate um, and just to get to hold the little babies and watch them grow and smile and learn to talk to you. And then they learn to talk back at you. And then they <laughs> <laughs> and you wish they were still goo goo. They're precious, precious, precious. A special prayer request today, our Southern Baptist Convention starts in New Orleans today. A lot of pastors converge all over the nation for this convention, and this convention is very important, as they always are each year, but our convention is under quite a bit of pressure um, from things that you see and hear on the radio and the television and social media. I don't, I'm just praying that things will go well and that the Lord will be glorified. So I'm asking you to lift those pastors and leaders up as they meet in New Orleans under the close watch of the media. Um, so, so many times parts of those discussions are lifted out and publicized out of context. But I pray that the Lord will be glorified. They have some tough decisions to make this week, but uh, that's happening in New Orleans starting today. Also note all those prayer requests in the back of your bulletin. Keep those things in mind, those folks, uh, as we update that uh, throughout the week. And, um, please uh, keep that in mind. Today we are celebrating and honoring our graduates. And I know that uh, I've learned that there may be some others that are graduating during the year. And we will give them uh, time as we find out some details about that. But for today... Uh, we are made aware that there are three who have graduated, uh, two from college and one from high school. Miss Laurie is going to play a song here, and I think uh, Miss Katie is going to come on down and join us up front.
from Psalm 4610. It is a daily journal, and, um, and it has scriptures each day. Um, this is for Kaylee. This is to Kaylee Montgomery. And this is an encouragement for you to continue to walk with the Lord, trust Him, write down your thoughts and journal, and, uh, and take your time as you study each day in His Word. And church, just because she's graduating doesn't mean that we have, we get to stop. We have to continue to support and encourage and pray and lift her up in prayer. And it has been a privilege for this church to have a part in your life. I want you to know that your smile means a lot to us. We look for that smile. And this says, Homeway Baptist Church proudly acknowledges the graduation of Kaylee Montgomery from Conway High School June 2, 2023. There's a scripture at the bottom that says, Show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. And this is for you. We love you, and we will continue to be praying for you. As I said earlier, we are aware that there are other graduates uh, coming up, and uh, we're going to get our thoughts together uh, and address those later on. Brother James Rose is one of those, and uh, Mary Hannah Cashin graduated from UNC Wilmington. She can't be here today either, uh, and I understand Miss Angie there is, uh, she's going to share with us some stuff later on when I find out all the details about her accomplishments there. So. A lot of folks uh, walking through this threshold and, and entering into a new phase of, of life. And it is so important, church, that we continue to lift these folks up, to pray for them, and to encourage them. Just the things that we hear from the radio, social media, television, they face every day. And it's in the palm of their hand, literally. And uh, it's a tough world to, to grow up in and to go out into, especially as a believer in Christ. But anyway, thank you, children. I just wanted them to be here and share in that and participate in that. They're going to go and have their children's uh, <laughs> message, and then we're going to sing and go into our song. So would y'all stand, please, as we sing Fresh Anointing. I'm good to go. 
But that's not the case. And our scripture, as we've been walking through Romans, especially Romans 5, has led us to a place that I am struggling with. And I have some dear friends and some folks that I have uh, asked for prayer and I've talked to and they've talked to me and some of them have been compassionate, some of them have been blunt but yet compassionate, some of them have been very helpful and encouraging, but I, I would like to kind of skip over some of the things that are difficult but we cannot, we have to deal with them and today we, we see what God's precious word has to say. And last week I never read the actual text, we talked about it, but I want to read it today we're in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. We're going to stop there, not 1 through 11, but 1 through 5. Would you join me there as we, as we read that? Chapter 5 of Romans, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction or access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And that word exalt means to glory or rejoice in the glory of God. And not only this, and this is where we are today, but we also exalt in our tribulations. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, perseverance proven character, proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And I want to stop right there because what we're talking about today is that we rejoice our glory in our tribulations. Now remember, these are benefits of righteousness. These are benefits of being a child of God. When's the last time you went through a struggle, a tribulation, a trial, and you were glorying, you were rejoicing in that tribulation? This is the problem that I have here lately is that going through some trials or some struggles or some stress or anxieties and having that opportunity to rejoice and not taking it, it means that we are being short-sighted. We have been inundated and we're just kind of blanketed with our circumstance and we have lost sight of what comes out of that circumstance. So I want you to see that today and understand that this is all about looking ahead. This is all about looking past our circumstance. You with me there? Y'all ever gone through some difficulties? All right. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but all of us do, don't we? Go through some difficulties and struggles. Paul certainly knows about that, and I'll read that to you in just a little bit. I have, uh, I have read from Will Graham's devotional for the last several weeks, and I wanted to write you, uh, to read this to you, to just encourage you, because sometimes... Our persecution isn't quite what other people's persecution is. Our persecution sometimes is having to drive on 501 between 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock. That's persecution. But sometimes we need a reminder of what persecution for our faith actually looks like. He quotes the scripture in Philippians 1, For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. As Paul writes the words there. Will Graham says, It's an honor to be counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. The pastor said to me as we stood on the tsunami-ravaged coastline in southern India. But he wasn't referring to the massive natural disaster which struck on December the 26th, 2004. He claimed the lie and claimed the lives of more than 250,000 people. Instead, the pastor was talking about the physical scarring that covered much of his body. You see, as the pastor was preaching one Sunday, a radical religious group burst into his church and doused him with acid. They burned his body from head to toe, leaving him disfigured. Miraculously, he survived the attack and has recovered to the point of ministering again to people who desperately need to know the hope of Jesus. However, due to the attack when he sweats, which is almost constantly given the tropical climate of the area, his body secretes blood. He showed me the drying blood that coated the fabric inside of his heavy white cotton gown, and he shared that he takes multiple showers a day to cool his body temperature. Sweating blood, the pastor said, is physically excruciating. How humbling and convicting. 
This man of God suffers moment by moment, day by day, because of his faith. There is no vacation from the pain that surrounds him. When he wakes in the morning and goes to bed at night, the scars, blood, and searing agony are a reminder. At this very moment, on the other side of the world, this pastor is in pain. Given that there's already been one attempt on his life, he must also live with the constant threat of additional bodily harm or death. And yet he counts it a joy and an honor. Could I say the same thing? No. I'm not sure that I could, Will Graham says. The Bible makes it very clear that we as Christians can expect persecution for our beliefs. In the United States, we have been very blessed to have the freedom to worship freely without the threat of imprisonment or death. But, what if that were no longer the case? On November the 5th, 2017, a murderous man with evil in his heart stepped into a church during the Sunday morning service and killed 26 people in a small Texas town. Many more were wounded. While I pray that this type of tragedy stays the exception and not the norm, one must still grapple with the thought of living in a world where your faith could cost you everything. Is it worth it to you? Is eternity with Jesus more important than the comforts of this world? More important than life itself? As you seek to learn from this pastor and from martyrs around the world, join me in leaning on the words of the Apostle Paul who was in prison for sharing the gospel. In his letter to the church of Philippi, he famously said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Hardship and persecution may come, but if your true hope is in eternity with Christ, you too can call it an honor to suffer for Him. Sometimes we just need a reminder of what other people actually go through for their faith. The word tribulations are here in the text today in verse 3, Romans 5, 3. It says, and not only this, but we also exalt, which means rejoice or to glory or to boast. It's translated boast sometimes in our tribulations. And I looked up the phrase, and I checked out the phrase, and it means exactly what it says. In, while in the process of the tribulation. Not after, it's over. But in, during. Actually, the same word is translated with child many times in Scripture. With child. It gives you that presence, that I'm in the moment. So we rejoice, we glory, we boast in, in the midst of a tribulation. Is that a hard thing to do sometimes? I wish I could stand here and say, I figured it all out, and then I've done it every single time. But that's not the case. I understand what the Bible says, but there are some times that Steve has to say, Lord, I'm sorry, I have failed in this test. Because I have lost sight. I'm consumed with what's here and now, and, and up, up on me right here, and I can't see past it. That's why we need one another, folks. That's why we need brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why we need godly family members and friends that we can go to and say, listen, I'm in a place I shouldn't be. I'm in a dark place. I can't get out. Can you help me? And they will. Sometimes it's a prayer. Sometimes it's a pat on the back. Sometimes it's a, it's a stern warning. You know how to get out of here. You, you need to spend time with the Lord and, and trust Him. And that's where this starts and stops, this trust in the Lord. That's the secret to this. That being able to rejoice triumph in our tribulations is trusting in Him. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians because this is a passage that is probably familiar to most and it is where Paul deals with his own form, the thing that has haunted him for a while and he wants to get rid of it. You ever had a trial or tribulation or something that was ongoing and you wanted to get rid of it? And it's not me. So <laughs> <laughs> Does God always say yes to our prayers? No. no. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says wait. Well, this is a case in time when God said no to Paul, of all people. Paul says, I'm in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 and following. It says, And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, to keep me from being prideful, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. 
Concerning this, I entreated, the word is beg, I begged the Lord, and entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So when God said, my sufficient is great, it is sufficient for you, my grace is sufficient for power is perfected in weakness. He's saying, my power is perfected in your weakness. I will rather boast about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Verse 10. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. Why? For when I am weak, then I am strong. You say, well, how, how can he say that? He was a man that, that learned under Gamaliel. He was a Pharisee. He knew all of these things. He was well educated. He grew up in a well-to-do kind of situation. What does he know about trials and tribulations? Well, let's take a look. Back up one chapter. Chapter 11, verse 23. Paul is still talking. He says, are they servants of Christ? He's, he's telling them, I too am a Jew. He's, he's defending his apostleship. He says, are they servants of Christ? I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten three times, excuse me, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews thirty-nine lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I have been, I have spent in the deep. I have been on the frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen. Dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, without food and cold exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure upon me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my, without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, He who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. Did Paul go through some struggles? He was shipwrecked more than me. His prop came off more than mine. I don't think so. <laughs> Folks, there is a way, and that's, that's the beauty of the, the message today. There is a way to have joy and to it, it, just to give God praise and to glory and to boast and rejoice in the midst of tribulation. I have heard pastors and people say that to become a Christian means that your troubles go away. I take it you disagree. <laughs> You know better than that. And unfortunately, there are people out there preaching and teaching that if you're still having troubles as a believer, it's because of lack of faith. That is so false. God's Word is very clear. It tells us throughout His, His, His Word, in the Old Testament and the New, people that follow Christ, people that, that live their lives according to, to what God has said, will indeed suffer. The New Testament says to expect. It's coming. What's the main difference? Is that we can see beyond it. And we know that it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And according to this passage, if you read on down here, it says, through that trial, we persevere. What is perseverance? It's, it's proof. It's proof of a character that comes out under pressure. I wanted to read this to you. I wrote it down somewhere. I'll find it in a minute. But it's pressure that's, that's put on an olive that brings out the oil. That pressure. Why do we go through trials? So that God can be glorified and we can depend on Him and learn that under pressure He brings out the thing that He's wanting the most in our lives. It is under that pressure. It is when we go through those trials that we grow close to Him that we learn to depend on Him. <coughs> Talking with Kaylee and the other graduates today, 
And I, I feel for them, especially these young folks who are living in the world that we hear about and it's so far into the world that most of us grew up in, yet it's their reality on a daily basis. Pressure. Pressure. I used to think peer pressure would go away when I got out of school. You and I know that is not the truth. We have peer pressure from well-meaning family, from friends, from our employers, from fellow employees. We have pressure from people that we just meet in our neighborhood. We have pressure from total strangers that happen to ask us a question that we have to answer that is counter to what they believe. There is pressure to give in to what our society has adopted as normal, as okay. It's not. You heard Dr. Jeff Gaskins talk about that just a couple weeks ago. Everything's not okay. It doesn't matter how politically correct it is. It's not correct biblically. So there's always pressure, and we need to lift these young folks up in prayer because they face it 24-7. As long as they own phone, they have pressure. If you don't like me, if you can't like my post, if no one's friending me on my whatever it is, then I know something's wrong with me. And they feel this constantly. You give in or you get ostracized. That's a lot of pressure for anybody, particularly our young folks. I want to read to you from uh, Brother McGee. Now, I've read to you some of the things that uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee said. And in his own words, this is how he comments on this passage. In other words, he says, we joy in troubles. We joy in troubles. Knowing that trouble works patience, patience doesn't come automatically for the believer in Christ. And patience experience and experience hope. And that's the progress. That is the the line that it comes. Patience, experience, experience, hope. And our hope is in Jesus. It is quite interesting to see the three words that are associated with trouble. One is joy. The other is hope. The last one is patience. God has to work that into us, although it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it takes trouble to bring out the best in the believer's life. If you don't hear anything else today in this message, hear this. In other words, it takes trouble to to bring out the best in the believer's life. The only way God can get fruit out of the life of the believer is by pruning the branches. The world does it differently. If you as an unbeliever are in a nice, comfortable situation and have no troubles, then you can have fun, you can also be patient, and you may have a little hope as you go along. But that is not the way it is with the child of God. Actually, trouble produces these fruits in our lives. What does that mean for you and for me? It means if we're praying sincerely for God's will to be accomplished in our lives, we are also saying, God, you do whatever you need to in my life to bring out what you need in me. That's going to glorify you. And that's pressure. That's trials. That's hardships. That's troubles. That's things that, that make us cling to Him. Make us cling to Him. And the more that happens, folks, the more confidence we have that He's going to bring us through, that He's there listening, that He cares for us. If you, if you aren't going through troubles, if your life is always smooth, there's something wrong. Because the Bible says, expect it to come. It doesn't say it might happen. It says expect it to come. And we can see very clearly throughout Scripture that that's the case uh, with all the folks that we read about in Scripture, some more than others, like with Joseph, and we'll read about that in just a moment, you may ask the question, can, can anything good come from my pain? You may be wondering that right now. Can anything good come from my pain? Lord, I don't, I don't understand this. I don't get this. It just doesn't make sense. How can anything good come out of this? That might be a legitimate question that we ask ourselves when we're going through the deepest parts of the valley. Can anything good come out of this? Yes. Dr. David Jeremiah writes these words uh, about this, and I wanted to, to read this to you. Um, he says, uh, <clears throat> well, just this quote, Few of us ever fully grasp the simple but painful truth. The heat of suffering is a refiner's fire. Purifying the gold of godly character and wisdom. You'll find that described in Malachi. 
Few of us ever fully grasp the simple but painful truth. The heat of suffering is a refiner's fire, purifying the gold of godly character and wisdom. The Bible says not to be discouraged when you have a disruptive moment. That is often a difficult truth to embrace in the midst of a painful event. God's Word assures us, though that problems and pain can be like a teacher in our life, instructing us in the ways of maturity. For our suffering yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You find that in Hebrews 12, 11. Pain can be our teacher. And I wanted to emphasize this today. Students, you will always be students if you choose to follow God because He teaches us along the way. And this says that even pain can be our teacher if we will allow it to be. Even as we confront illness, pain, and injury, we need to be biblical Christians claiming God's promises and living with His presence and purposes in mind. When experiencing adversity, it helps to remember that the biblical heroes of old weren't immunized against pain in life. Scripture is filled with accounts of their suffering. Job lived a life of integrity, and yet he lost his family, his wealth, the admiration of his wife, and his health. Peter's mother-in-law occupied a sickbed. Samuel became very feeble. King David anguished over the condition of his newborn son. Every biblical character called by God experienced problems in life, so pain is not exclusive to us. Even the Son of Man suffered violent, life-ending injuries and excruciating pain at the hands of his enemies in order to carry out God's will for his life. And you'll find that in Philippians 2. When we encounter pain, the question should not be, why is this happening to me? Which is probably the most common question. Or, what am I going to do? Instead, listen to this, we should pray, Lord, what do you want to teach me in this disruptive moment? I am your ready and willing student. Teach me everything you know I need. I don't want to waste this suffering. I want to walk through it, come out of the other side, having learned everything I can so that it will be an occasion for God to be glorified. God allows no pain without purpose. He allows no pain without purpose. The key here is to see it as an opportunity instead of an obstacle. An opportunity instead of an obstacle. For the believer in Christ, it's an opportunity to grow closer, to trust Him, to depend on Him, to see Him working in our lives and through us. It may be the doctors or the nurses or those that are attending us when we go through all these trials that need Christ. It may be our testimony while we're going through this pain and this anguish that leads them to say yes to the Lord. We never know. But we must see trials and tribulations as opportunities, not as obstacles. We will grow if we see it that way. We will move forward in our walk with Christ. Trust God for the outcome. Trust Him for the outcome. You with me? Do you always do that? Do you always rejoice in trials and tribulations? I've already admitted to you that I don't, and here lately struggling. Is it always the truth that we should and we can? Yes. God's Word says so. So it doesn't matter if we get it right all the time or not. God's Word is right all the time. So if, if it's not that we're finding it as an occasion to grow, it's not on Him. His Word doesn't need to change to accommodate us. We need to change to accommodate Him. Amen. You and I always go through trials and tribulations, but if we're not growing, if we're not seeing it as an opportunity for growth, it's on us. It's not on Him. God has promised if we trust Him, He will respond. He will work. He will use us. He will glorify Himself through our lives. If that's not happening, it's on us, not Him. He is faithful. You can depend on God more than you can depend on anything else or anybody else. Amen. He always shows up just like He says. Always. 100% of the time. As we close today, I want to read this to you. It's a poem by Frida Hanberry Allen. It's about Joseph. God meant it unto good 
oh blessed assurance, falling like sunshine all across life's way, touching with heaven's gold earth's darkest storm clouds, bringing fresh peace and comfort day by day. T'was not by chance the hands of faithless brethren sold Joseph captive to a foreign land, nor was it chance which after years of suffering brought him before the monarch's throne to stand. One eye, all seeing, saw the need of thousands and planned to meet it through that one lone soul and through the weary days of prison bondage was working towards the great and glorious goal. As yet the end was hidden from the captive, the iron entered even to his soul. His eye could scan the present path of sorrow, not yet his gaze might rest upon the whole. Faith failed not through those long, dark days of waiting. His trust in God was recompensed at last. The moment came when God led forth his servant to secure many, all his sufferings past. It was not you but God that sent me hither. Witness triumphant faith in after days. God meant it, meant it unto good. No second causes mingle their discord with his song of praise. God means it unto good for thee, beloved. The God of Joseph is the same today. His love permits affliction strange and bitter. His hand is guiding through the unknown way. Thy Lord, who sees the end from the beginning, hath purposes for thee of love untold. Then place thy hand in his and follow fearless till thou the riches of his grace behold. There, when thou standest in the home of glory and all life's path lies open to thy gaze, thine eyes shall see the hand which thou trustest and magnify his love through endless days. We can't see the whole picture, folks. God and God alone can see the whole picture. We trust Him. We grow. We see our <coughs> trials as opportunities. Do you think God loves you? Yes. Do you know that God loves you? Yes. You should. He does. There is not one trial you will ever face that takes God by surprise. There is not one tribulation, not one struggle, not one heartbreak that God is unaware of. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants you to turn to Him. Not away, but to Him. We can learn from Job that sometimes we just want to turn to God and say, God, what are you doing? Are you paying attention? Look at what's happening to me. Job did that. And then he came to his senses when God said, you know who put this place in and in, in, who created all this? Where were you when I created all this? And Job was reminded, God is God. And he placed his trust in him. He said, whatever you do, though you slay me, I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to worship you. Folks, you and I, it's not our job to understand why things happen the way they do. It's not our job. I'm not going to figure it all out. What is our job and responsibility and privilege is to trust our Lord. Trust him. Hold his hand. Struggle with Him as He walks with you, as you choose to walk with Him through the storms, through the trials, through the struggles. The Bible says you and I can exult and should exult and will exult in the midst of tribulations. We rejoice, we glory, we boast in the midst of the tribulations. Why? Because we see through it. And one day, the hope, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ will come to be reality for us. Trials are temporary. Eternity is forever. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ. And you'll get through it and you'll be able to rejoice in the midst of it because you see the purpose and you see God working in and through your life and you see the fact that He can work through you and reach to others who are around you taking care of you giving you band-aids, taking care of your treatments, 
help you with whatever, God will use you. He will glorify himself, and you will get through it one way or the other because eternity is coming. And that's our home, folks. That is our home forevermore. We're going to sing the chorus to this song as we close. It's a song that we have sung in a while. <laughs> if ever. Um, through it all. This is an Andre Crouch song that came out many, many years ago. The verse says, and we're not going to sing the verse, but I want to share it with you. I've had many tears and sorrow. Maybe you can identify with this. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong, but in every situation, God gave blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. Stand with you. Stand with Let's sing together just the chorus through it all. Lord, we thank you for their lives, their smiles, their joy. We thank you for their anticipation of what's coming next, Lord. And we ask you, please put a hedge of protection around them. Such a world that we live in is, is counter to everything that you've written in your word. And you tell us it's going to be that way. And they're in the midst of it. Father, I pray that you would raise up this church and others to encourage our young people, to reach out to them, to pray for them. To give them guidance and wisdom from the experiences that we've had. I pray that you would teach us to love, even when people are different, to love. Also, Father, I pray that you keep us close to your word. Help us not to water it down, to change it, to try to fit into this world because we're aliens here. But to give people the truth of the gospel, which gives them opportunity for salvation. Father, I pray that you continue to pour out your presence in our lives. Teach us to rejoice even in the midst of tribulations. Thank you for your presence today. And thank you that as we leave this building, the church goes forward into this world as a light, as a beacon, as hope. Now, Father, I ask you to bless these folks. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord bless Lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.